uh, 2001 Mars Odyssey mission uh, is NASA's longest lasting spacecraft at Mars. The spacecraft was launched in April of 2001 and it reached its destination in October of 2001. Its mission was to make the, um, the, the global elements of Mars known, kind of the chemical composition, find out what was on the planet, figure out what life was like on Mars. And it successfully completed its primary science mission from February 2002 through August 2004, but it actually continues in its mission and operations even today. What I did not know, though, is that there was actually a time when uh, the mission was in doubt a few times. Of course, this, this device is running on complex computer systems. There's actually an A system and a backup system, a B system. And they weren't sure whether the B system was actually going to work. And, they were, and then the A system started to have some trouble. So back in 2009, Mission Control decided to do a reboot. They did a reboot of the operating system. And as the orbiter properly followed the commands to shut down and restart, um, they could see that the orbiter... All of its memory had been cleared, and all the memory from the last five years it accumulated had cleared, and the reboot worked. Not only did the A system continue to function, but now they knew the B system actually worked too. So just like the Mars Odyssey, a reboot can get a system better prepared for the rest of the mission. And in some ways, I actually think that's what we're doing as a church. This is what we're doing at Living Faith Bible Church. Whether you're joining us by live stream or here in person or in the parking lot and throughout the rest of the summer and onward, we are rebooting our lives together as a church because our mission continues. So today we kind of continue this sermon series in 1 Peter and we're going to be looking at the first nine verses of, of chapter one, as we think about what a reboot looks like, let's be honest. Our nation is going through a reboot. We watch the news and we watch what's happening in different places as certain things open up and we begin to experience more of life. So as a nation, we're going through a reboot. Maybe on a personal level, you're also going through a reboot. For about 12 weeks, you lived your life a certain way. It became your new normal, but it was not something that you were that comfortable with, perhaps. You knew you had to do it. We all did it. But now we're beginning to change our way of life. In a sense, we're going through a reboot. Maybe you're experiencing a new normal way of life after this reboot. And as a church, we are experiencing a re reboot of our life together as we start to publicly gather indoor and outdoor after 12 weeks of being completely isolated from one another. How will we do this reboot? How are we going to reboot the operating system of our church in a sense? Well, that's where 1 Peter chapter 1 really does help. As I shared with you last week, if you were able to listen um, and join us, last week I shared with you that there are four building blocks for the reboot that we see in the, in the letter that we call 1 Peter, written by the Apostle Peter to those disciples, those Jews and Gentiles who had believed in Jesus, who were scattered throughout what is now called modern-day Turkey. And as we read through the book of 1 Peter, we see these four building blocks at work. One building block is what I'm calling becoming. It's about our identity. You, you need, we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see today in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that our identity is fundamentally defined by our new birth, our new identity, our new life in Jesus Christ. We have to know that. We have to know who we are if we're going to successfully reboot our lives together. We also have to focus on the building block of believing. Our thinking has to be sharpened and changed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, with minds that are alert and fully sober, as we've gone from this crisis and now we're engaging again with the world and with our mission and with our church, we have to have our thinking formed by what God wants us to believe and to see about the world. And so our believing 
regarding the biggest questions of life have to be informed by Scripture and by God's promises to us. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. We'll also see that the third building block that we're going to be looking at throughout this sermon series is belonging. Relating to one another. We're going to actually have to learn, in a sense, how to relate to one another in new ways as we've moved from isolation to gathering together again. And 1 Peter chapter 2 describes our relationship together as the body of Christ this way. You are the chosen people, a holy nation, God's special belonging, God's special possession. We are God's people and we're going to have to discover that again and how we belong to one another. How in some ways, yes, yes, we, we found it maybe easy to isolate, but now we have to, we have to come together because that's who God has made us to belong to one another. And then fourthly, we're going to have to talk about behaving as God's special people. How are we going to behave? The reality is, is this crisis has highlighted for many people in their minds what is wrong with our country. Not only have we had the crisis, but then we've had the racial unrest and we've had the terrible killing of George Floyd and we have all of the consequences of that. And there's a sense in which the world around us wants to see. So who, who has a faith who's real? Who has a faith that can witness and tell the truth? And so, so there's a sense in which we have to live differently. We have to behave in a way that shows who we belong to. And 1 Peter, the theme of 1 Peter really emphasizes that building block as well. Those four building blocks are so important for us as we think about what it means to reboot our lives as individuals and as a church. But as we turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, we're going to see today that um, there is an important element, uh, becoming and believing. Those two building blocks are, are highlighted for us in 1 Peter. So turn in your Bible, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read to you verses 3 to 9 as we think about how we can experience who God wants us truly to be and how by believing in his promises we can become the people that God wants us to be. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honor, when Jesus Christ is revealed, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. What I want you to be able to see here today in First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9 is this big idea that from the cradle to the grave, as you and I believe, God is overseeing who we are becoming. Who are we becoming? That's the most fundamental question that every one of us has to answer. Who were we before the COVID crisis? Who were we during it? And who are we now? We're in the process of becoming. And throughout our lives, we need to know who God says we are. And, and in these uh, verses here in 1 Peter chapter 1, we see three important elements of who we're becoming. I want you to notice that, first of all, there is the cradle. The cradle. Now, there's a sense in which every one of us, our life and who we are becoming begins in our actual cradle. Our physical cradle. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that God saw us in our mother's womb. The Bible says in Psalm 139 that every day of our lives was written down in God's book before one came to be. In that sense, God saw us in our cradle. But what, what I'm talking about here is our cradle of faith, the new birth. 
In the cradle of faith, our new birth, God gives us a new life as children of his, a new life and a new hope. And that is so important for us to understand. That's the foundation of our life with God. There's also the grave. So there's a sense in which our life is framed by the cradle and the grave. But for the Christian, it's beyond the grave. It's the life that we have with God, the hope we have with God. Theologians call that our glorification. It's when we're glorified. And we'll see in just a moment that Peter talks about the, the great hope that we have, a living hope beyond the grave. And so our, who, who we are becoming is defined even by who we will be in the future, even beyond the grave with the resurrection and all that God will make us in Jesus Christ. But in the middle, between the cradle of our faith and our grave and beyond, there is what I call the crucible. The world, real world trials. God prepares his people during trying times. He uses it for our sanctification so that we can become holy. And we're going to need to talk about how God is allowing these things in our lives and what he's using the crucible. I, I use the word crucible and maybe you know what the word crucible is. There's a picture of a, of a pot there, but it, it's this thing where you, you, know, you can put things in there and, and it boils. And if you put metal in and over time, it can, the impurities boil up to the surface and it's a purifying thing in our lives as Christians, that God uses the crucible, the trials of our lives, to bring about our sanctification. So let's look in more detail at each of these. First, there's the cradle. In the cradle of faith, our new birth, God gives his children a new life and a new hope. Look at what the Apostle Peter says in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth. New birth. What is the new birth? Well, the Bible uses several different terms and language to describe it. It's called born again in John chapter 3. It's called born above from 1 John chapter 5. There are various verses that describe this work of transformation in us. But in essence, it's a reboot. It's a remaking of us from the inside out. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it's described this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Some of the older translations say a new creature. There's a new life that God brings about in us. And you might say, well, why is that necessary? Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, when he spoke to Nicodemus, the, one of the most religious leaders of his day, he said to him, point blank, he said, Nick, you must be born again. Why? Because we have to pass from death and sin to forgiveness and life. It's necessary because without it, we have an old sinful nature which only knows how to sin, that doesn't know how to please God, that's subject to judgment and condemnation. We need a new life. We need a new identity. And to be born again is to receive a new nature, a new identity, and a new destiny in Jesus Christ. And what happens? Well, verses 3 and 4 says that it's a living hope that, that we get entry into a whole new way of life and eternity with God is made certain by Christ's resurrection. When Christ rose from the dead, he assured that everyone who is in Christ will rise with him again. It's not only a new life, but it's a whole new destiny. So how? How does one experience the new birth? The Bible says that when we believe we are born again by the action of the Holy Spirit, we are washed, we are renewed and cleansed, and we're given a new nature. In, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says that uh, to all who believe, to those who received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Not children born of natural descent or a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We receive a new nature from God himself. And in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So how do you experience this new birth? Simply by believing, by receiving Christ, by receiving the gift of eternal life that God offers to us. That's how simple it is. 
But I also know that everyone's experience with the new birth is different. Let me say it this way. Everyone must experience a new birth, but not everyone's experience with it will be the same. Let me say that again. Everyone must experience a new birth, but not everyone's experience with it will be the same. I often like to use the analogy of the microwave versus the crock pot. You know, if you want to heat something in a microwave, it only takes a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes at most to heat something, right? You can heat it pretty thoroughly and it changes the nature of that thing. It goes from being a raw meat to cooked meat in just a matter of a couple of minutes. And maybe some of us in our life with God have experienced that fundamental change and it seemed like it was a microwave. It was just overnight. You went from darkness and sin to to light and life. Maybe that's been your experience in the new birth. But for many other people, their experience is more like a crock pot. Slow and steady, simmering, taking a while for the juices to really work in. Maybe some of you, and looking at my, my daughters here who have grown up in church, it's been like, you know, the simmering, the simmering word of God has been sort of working in your life over many years. Perhaps there's not one particular time when someone who's grown up in the church can say fundamentally, though sometimes you have those experiences, right? You have those moments with God. But here's the point. Are you fundamentally different? Do you feel that your identity and your destiny is now with God? That's what the new birth is all about. And every one of us must must experience that. And we must experience that all the way until the grave and beyond. Notice what Peter says now in verses 4 and 5. He says, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you until and beyond the grave when we will receive our glorification, when our earthly life will be no more and we will have an eternal body, we will have a heavenly nature, we will be, our sinful nature will be removed from us. That's our glorification until the grave and beyond when God promises to bless us to the fullest extent possible ever, ever more. Sometimes people say, I don't know, heaven sounds a little boring. Kind of sounds a little bit like, you know, like a never-ending church service. Maybe some of us have thought about that, thought of it that way. No, there actually is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I believe we're going to be busy, we're going to be working, we're going to be serving God. Our lives are going to be fuller than ever, but our lives are going to be more purposeful than ever, but our lives are going to be glorifying God forever and ever. But here's the truth. Heaven is going to be a place where God is never going to cease to be blessing us and showing his goodness to us. And I don't know about you, but that's a place I want to be. Because if God is eternal, his blessings can be eternally manifold to us. They'll never end. We'll always be enamored and filled with joy at what God will bring us from day to day. And that's an inheritance that can never perish or spade or never, never perish, spoil or fade because it's kept in heaven for you. What kind of inheritance can you expect in this life? For some of us, maybe there is a physical inheritance that we will receive but for, but for those of us who are children of God, there is an eternal inheritance that will be kept in heaven for us, that will never perish, spoil, or fade. That's God's destiny for you as his child. And, and he says that, that, that we will experience that if we put our faith and our trust in God in this life. Notice what he says in verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see, our inheritance will only be revealed when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's talking about his second coming. Only then will we receive our glorified bodies. Only then will he begin to reign and rule on the earth. So only then will we see the full nature of it. If we pass away, if we go to be with the Lord before Jesus comes, 
we will be in his presence and we'll experience a wonderful transformation and we'll be with the Lord. But even still, we're waiting for the resurrection of our bodies when Jesus comes, when life is revealed. I want you to notice he says in verse 9 that we're all waiting to receive the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Salvation is the making us whole and complete, the complete healing of our souls, making us one with God forever, giving us an eternal being with him forever. That's who you're becoming. The end result of those who are children of God is becoming the ones who God destined us to be. See, God is overseeing all of our lives from the cradle to the grave and beyond. And he has a destiny plan for us, which is marvelous and wonderful. And we need to see that to be able to know as we go through life what God has for us. But between the cradle and the grave in the middle is the crucible. Again, a crucible is this boiling pot. This, this time of tumult, during this time, the heat is turned up and we experience hardship. Notice what Peter says in verse 6. Between the cradle and the grave, he says, in all this you greatly rejoice. You rejoice about your hope. But notice what he says, though now, for a little while, you may have to, have, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Peter was speaking to those who were going to experience extreme hardship. There was a persecution that was coming to God's people. And in fact, in AD 64 with Emperor Nero, the persecution of the church really hit a high point and continued on all the way through the 90s and even beyond. And during that time, many Christians suffered and even died as martyrs. And, and the Holy Spirit, sensing this was going to happen, wrote... Uh, inspired the Apostle Peter to write these words to people who were suffering and would experience even more suffering. Suffering grief and all kinds of trials. Between the, our birth in Christ and between our release and our, in our death beyond the grave, in the middle is the crucible where there is the trials of life. In some ways, we've experienced the trials of life in ways we never thought during these last uh, 14 weeks, even more than that, right? Since the crisis of COVID first started. I want to ask you, during this crisis, has your faith been strengthened through the crucible? Or has it weakened in some ways? And to be honest with you, there may be a variety of answers anywhere in between, but it's important for us to be honest about where our faith is. For some of us, not only have we gone through this crisis, but we've also loved, lost loved ones. We've seen people sick. We've seen things happen in our lives. And maybe in some ways it's, it's challenged our faith. It's okay to be honest about maybe our faith is weak and it needs to be strengthened. Maybe this time of reboot will allow you to reboot your, your perspective and your thinking and, and gain a new perspective on God in the midst of this. But for others of us, we've realized that maybe in some ways our faith has been strengthened because we've realized what's truly important. And we've understood that this crucible that we've gone through, these trials of many kinds, have, God has used in our lives. And that's why God brings in trials. He brings it in. And here's the reason he brings it in. Look at verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by the fire. The crucible, right? Refined by the fire. What happens? The true nature of it is revealed as the impurities rise to the surface and are skimmed off. What remains is the true nature of our faith, the, the true metal of our faith. That's why God allows and brings trials into our lives, not because he wants to see us squirm, but because he wants our faith to be strengthened. Between the cradle and the grave lies the crucible. And in that time, God is forming who we are becoming in Jesus Christ. We can take heart that God is overseeing every aspect of our lives. And what will happen, hopefully what will happen is it will result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed so when Jesus Christ comes, perhaps in our lifetime, 
our faith will be revealed as genuine. If we go to be with the Lord, those trials will reveal that our faith is genuine, that we really did believe in him, that we really were born again, that we really had a new nature. That's the reason God brings trials into our life. I said in the, the morning in the outdoor service, you know, some days I wish I was a prosperity preacher. It'd be easy for me to say, just believe in God and everything will be okay. If you just have enough faith, you won't have any trials. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't, how do you explain COVID then? I mean, does, does God allow things to happen in our lives that are hard and tough? Yes. Does the Bible say that he does? Yes. We, we, we can't believe in a false gospel that just says everything's going to be okay. That everything is always fine. That just sugarcoats things. No, the Bible is very clear as we see in verse 6 and verse 7. You'll experience grief and trials of many kind. These have come so that your faith can be strengthened. And what, that's what we want to experience. And I hope that's what we've been experiencing through this time. That our faith is, is strengthened and refined through the fire. From cradle to beyond the grave, God is at work. God is at work as we believe, helping us to become the people he wants us to be. Do you believe that? Are you experiencing that? That's what it means to have your life focused as you go through the reboot so let me bring you to a point of invitation in closing. Notice what um, the Apostle Peter says. These words uh, are very important. In verse 5, he says, through faith. In verse 8, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Do you see? Love, believe, faith. How do we become who God wants us to be, one of the first building blocks of a reboot. Well, we have to experience that second building block of reboot. We have to believe. We have to be believing in Him. Believing in Him when we first believe in Him for our salvation. Believing in Him through the trials that we experience in our lives and not losing faith in Him. That He's bringing us through the refining fire for His purpose and for His good and for our good and glory. And bringing us through so that in the end He can show the inexpressible inheritance that He has for us and the joy and the peace that He has for us beyond the grave, believing in him. So let me ask you today as we close, are you believing the promises of God in the gospel? Have you been born again? Do you believe that as a sinner, you had to let go and have to let go of your old life of sin and receive the new life through spiritual rebirth? And if you haven't yet, the question is, what are you waiting for? Let me ask you also, have you believed and are you experiencing that newfound faith? And is that helping you go through these trials of life that you're experiencing in the crucible? Do you believe that God is working in your life even in these hard times? And will you trust God today to bring you through to tomorrow in the crucible of faith? And let me ask you one more thing. Do you believe without a shadow of a doubt in your heart that you have an inheritance that is kept secure for you in heaven? Not because of what you can do to please God, but what Jesus has already done for you in his death and the sprinkling of his blood on your life, that you have an inheritance that's kept secure in heaven for you. Do you have that assurance? Do you believe that from cradle to grave? Do you believe that God is overseeing who you're becoming and are you trusting in him? That's the gospel. That's the good news. Let's pray. Our Father in God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather as your people. Thank you for your word which speaks to us in these challenging times we face. I pray, Lord, that as we have studied your word, that you have spoken to your people and that you will minister to each of them in the ways that they need this day. I pray that as the spirit speaks to hearts, that those who have not been born again, born anew, will come to understand the necessity of it 
and understand how they can, through faith, believe in Jesus as the Savior and Lord of their lives and be born again, born from above. And that in believing and trusting in Him as their Savior, that they will experience Him throughout their life in the challenges of life all the way through the grave and beyond. Give them that assurance and that hope even today if they have not received it today. For those of us who know that we are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ but are experiencing trials in life and have gone through these trials especially during this crisis and and maybe our faith has been weakened, I pray that you can help us reboot our lives and allow us to focus our minds on you and have our strength, our faith strengthened once again. I pray, Lord, that as we gather together more as your people, as we gather together online and in person, that you would help us to come to a greater understanding of who we belong to, that we belong to you and therefore we belong to one another and you would strengthen us in the mission that you've called us to as the church of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray for your people this day. Strengthen and help them in their crucibles and their trials in life. And as you strengthen them, Lord, help their faith, the genuineness of their faith to be proven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, And all of God's people said, Amen.